Welcome to BIV Today, the daily podcast from the newsroom of Business in Vancouver. I'm Kurt LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief. Despite the wonders of a rapidly developed vaccine and the Herculean efforts of our healthcare workers, the pandemic has revealed significant shortfalls in the effectiveness and efficiency of parts of our healthcare sector. One shortfall is the sheer shortage of labor, how it is arrayed, how its dearth stands to even harm patients, citizens, and societies. My guest today is one of the world's authorities on the challenge of healthcare economics and some of the available solutions. Dr. Mark Britnell is KPMG's vice chair in the UK. He's author of Human, Solving the Global Workforce Crisis. Uh, he's gonna be featured at the 21st Annual Healthcare Summit Thursday and Friday here in Vancouver, presented by Reboot Communications. We're uh, proud to be a, a media sponsor of this event. Good to have you with us. Hi, Kirk. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, give us the global picture here, Mark. Uh, where does the planet generally fail on this? Well, you're certainly on point with your introduction, Kirk. We know, for example, from the United Nations that by 2030, uh, the world will be short of 18 million healthcare workers, which is roughly 20% of the total capacity to care. So just to give you some examples, in my own country, the United Kingdom, uh, we have a vacancy rate of 10% of, of all hosts. In America, the richest country on the planet that spends nearly 19% of its GDP on healthcare, they are short of 1 million nurses and 120,000 doctors. In China, when they relaxed the one child policy, they forgot to tell the obstetricians they're now short of 120,000 obstetricians by 2023. In India, where Prime Minister Modi, for example, is launching, as he calls it, the largest migration towards universal healthcare in the history of humanity. He's doing so being short of 4 million doctors and nurses. And even in Japan, a country that prior to COVID, I would visit twice a year, has trebled the number of nurses over the last 13 years it is still predicted to be short of 250,000 nurses in Japan by 2025. And we know, of course, the vacancy rates now, the sharp staff shortages in many provinces in Canada is starting to bite. Is there is there any kind of, uh, you know, Lithuania or Liechtenstein uh, or some little place on the, on the planet that actually does this well? No, um, you kindly refer, sadly, no. But you kindly referred to my book, Human, Solving the Global Workforce Crisis, that's now um, sold in uh, dozens and dozens of countries worldwide, just last year published in uh, Mandarin for the Chinese market as well. Uh, I identified 10 high impact solutions that if coordinated and orchestrated, uh, can make a difference to this 18 million shortage. Um, they're they're um, being more optimistic for a second, uh, all solutions uh, do exist, but they're just found in different health systems in different countries. And so really, my book is a call to arms for po politicians, for healthcare professionals, for patients, and indeed the public to start thinking more radically about this problem because it's hurtling towards us. And make no mistake about this, Kirk, every country now on the planet realizes, I think, uh, probably for the first time, that healthcare is no longer a cost, it's a value. And a well-staffed mm -hmm. health service, it really has proved to be a most excellent antidote to COVID in terms of economic recovery, saving and protecting lives, and restarting uh, economies as well. So, so in the time that we have, Mark, I, I want, do want to go through some of the systemic changes that you've identified as, as potential uh, prescriptions for all of us. But in a, in a broad outline, when you point to the shortfall of actual labor, is it just that or are people just not also properly deployed? Well, that's a, that's a good question. So it's, it's both, um, to be honest with you, Kirk. I mean, there, there, there comes a point where you simply don't have enough clinically trained staff and that becomes a clinical and patient safety issue. But also that we know that some of the care models, how care is delivered, is somewhat stuck in the 20th century, not the 21st century. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes patients, as you well know, especially with your hallway waits in 
in Canada and your aged care problems now that uh, many journalists, included the great Andre Picard, have pointed to. We know that patients aren't getting the right care in the right place by the right people at the right time. So it's a combination of both things, actually, Kirk. Yeah. Your book, though, does point to a chronic decision-making flaw and, and, and around the globe, which is to choose shorter term rather than sustainable solutions. So how large a gap is that? Well, you're right. Um, and dare I say it, well read as well. I call this phenomenon cognitive dissonance. And for those that aren't familiar with cognitive dissonance, it's the it's the ability to say one thing and do another at the same time. And I draw attention particularly to our political classes that uh, almost everywhere you go in the world, uh, our political classes talk about their love for the health service, their love for the health workers, their admiration for health workers putting themselves and their lives on the line during COVID. And yet time and time again, failing to plan for the right number of healthcare workers in the future, failing to finance the right number of students in medical or nursing or clinical education, and then often also stopping uh, contentious but sensible uh, clinical service changes between various hospitals and between hospital care, primary care, community care and home care. So I call out, if you like, the political class for basically having it easy by talking about their love for health professionals, but failing to plan, which is their duty in finance for a future and sustainable supply of healthcare workers in the future. That has to change. Is it just that politicians don't think about 15 and 20 years hence, they think about 15 and 20 months hence? Did you say 15 and 20 minutes or months? Well, I'll, I'll give you minutes if you'd like, but I would even, I'll be generous and say months. Yeah. Now, of course, one shouldn't be facetious. Uh, I mean, all politicians come into politics to, to want to change and they're genuine in that belief. I, I would say there are three reasons. I, I would I, I point to the, the, the time horizons for politics are, are often three, four or five years. The time horizons for training um, a specialist uh, surgeon or a physician are often 10, 11 or 12 years. That's the first point. Secondly, of course, um, actually encouraging school leavers and university leavers to think about health uh, as a future uh, rewarding career can sometimes now be difficult when there are easier and better paid jobs to, to, to do. And then thirdly, of course, uh, then making sure that um, we can transfer skills and ally them to the digital revolution, something healthcare has been particularly pernicious in resisting. So that there are a combination of factors. It's not just politicians. Uh, royal colleges uh, that look after um, forecasts for surgical training numbers or royal colleges of, of uh, physicians that are in charge of looking at uh, forward planning for physician numbers. These uh, demarcations between various surgical or medical tribes also, ironically, can get in the way on occasions. So it's um, what we call a wicked complex problem, that's for sure. But um, certainly um, we've seen that countries that don't face this problem head on face a larger problem down the line. Yeah. I've witnessed so many businesses change their criteria, their metrics about what they believe um, are the deliverable uh, outputs of, of their uh, activity. Um, is the healthcare se uh, sector suffering from you know, lack of new criteria, lack of new metrics to improve the system? That's a very good point. I would say, um, and I, you know, I applaud the work that the Canadian Medical Association is now starting to do, reaching out to partners across the, the healthcare system to have a more realistic uh, debate about what skills you need and what training you need. If I can put it uh, crudely, the old fashioned way of staffing in healthcare was to match an old fashioned out of date job description with a job and find out that actually the clinical practice behind that job has changed quite substantially because of new uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, new technologies, uh, new data and digital services. And so um, uh, many of us now believe instead of matching jobs to job descriptions, we have to match skills to tasks. And of course that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about training and education. 
And some of these colleges, you know, certainly I can speak in my own uh, country, are centuries old. They have built up a great body of power, of wisdom and of work over the centuries. But life is changing very quickly as some of the industries that you work with, Kirk, you, you know. And therefore, I think uh, healthcare has to be more agile, it has to be more nimble, and it has to be, I think, more expansive in its thought and uh, keen to experiment. Okay, but that raises the whole point. So many systems are themselves uh, inherently top down. How are, where's the place for patients? Well, patients, patients that's a great point. So I, I did, one of my 10 solutions is harnessing the power of patients as partners and communities as carers. So um, there are some great examples around the world where patients have been given more power. So for example, in, in Germany, uh, older patients were given the budget to care for themselves. They could spend that budget on their family, on their relatives, on their neighbors in the community, uh, or indeed healthcare professionals. The state uh, trained the caregivers, uh, regulated to make sure there was no abuse or fraud. And we found dramatic improvements in patient uh, experience, patient happiness, uh, redu reductions in length of stay in hospital. So that's just one example. We also know that patients with long-term conditions drive 70% of healthcare costs. We know right. that uh, the more they're en enabled uh, and empowered, through coaching and mentoring of healthcare staff supported by clever diagnostics and wearables, uh, such as Apple watches and others, sensors, monitors, that they can take control of their care in a much more proactive, sustainable and positive way. So we're just really at the cusp of this at the moment. Um, it's a very large growing industry, as you can imagine. Uh, there are uh, all sorts now of, of companies interested in getting into the mix of this. And so you're right to say that actually patients as partners and communities as carers have a very important role to play. One important fact, we know there are four levels of patient dependency. The lowest level sees the patient belief that the doctor is God. And of course, uh, you'll know some people that still believe that up to level four, where the, where the doctor is um, not a God, but a guide. Uh, and that level of uh, empowerment counterintuitively Counterintuitively, as patients become more empowered, their consumption of care reduces by between 18 and 21 percentage points. So quite a substantial hmm. prize to be gained there, I think. Yeah. Where, where does Dr. Dr. Google fit in all of this, Mark? Well, of course, uh, he's now or she's now ubiquitous. Um, and of course, that presents many challenges for today's professions. Uh, they spend some time correcting uh, the, the, the go Google searches that patients have. But that, I think they're also realistic to, enough to realize now that patients will, um, if kept waiting, um, want mm -hmm. to uh, research their own uh, best practice. And we've seen now a plethora of uh, GP at hand, uh, doctors uh, on demand, digital doctors providing those services. So although some healthcare professionals quite rightly will question the validity of the sources of that data, they should never question the validity of the attempts of patients to seek higher quality healthcare information. And that frankly means switching channels and having channels open uh, longer and perhaps being more personal to the patients making those requests. Yeah. So many of the systems in society are undergoing, as you know, a, a real reckoning, a reckoning around uh, equity, uh, opportunity. Um, and it can sometimes be along gender, along race, along a number of other factors and all this. How much inequity of, uh, is, is there in our medical system, do you think? Well, it's a, it's a very big issue. As you know, uh, recently you've had your own issues in, in Canada with your uh, uh, indigenous communities. Those factors have been starkly exposed across the world in terms of the inequalities that um, exist between economic groups, uh, gender and uh, racial groups, just to name but three. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly, from what I see, I, I've worked in 80 countries over the last 12 or 13 years. I, I don't believe any government now can ignore these issues. In my own country, in the United Kingdom, our Prime Minister now talks about levelling up as being a central concern of the government. I, I know wherever you go, uh, earlier this morning, uh, I was talking from Vancouver to colleagues in India, in Singapore, in Italy, in the United Kingdom, uh, in Toronto, in Halifax, in Sydney, 
uh, and uh, this issue is is uh, a pressing concern now for all governments because um, if you like it's issues that have been swept under the carpet for decades that have been known about in civilized society are no longer civilized at all and so mm. whether it's a reckoning the like of which you're having in Canada at the moment or indeed the conversations that are taking place in New Zealand about Maori people or Australia about uh, Aboriginal people, for example. Um, I, I think now uh, governments have nowhere to turn. They have to uh, tackle these problems transparently and in a transformational fashion. Hmm. Where, where's, the, um, where's the room for emotional intelligence, for empathy, for personal intimacy with the employer? Well, that, let's start, start about the, the uh, emotional uh, empathy with the patient. And as you know, the, from the cover of my book, we have uh, two hands, a, a robotic hand and a hand trying to connect on the cover of my book, Human. Quintessentially, whatever we think about technology and digitization and, and working on Teams or Zoom, at the end of the day, uh, the wonder of healthcare is the warm heart and kind touch of one human being placed on another. It's the hallmark of a civilized society and it's the hallmark of our humanity. And that should never disappear. But in itself, it's uh, important, but no longer given the workforce crisis will be sufficient. And therefore we have to think of ways in which women and men can conquer technology, for example, to make care go further and farther. Quite simply put we, uh, put, we face a future in healthcare where there is too much healthcare work and too few healthcare workers. And, and therefore, this issue about emotional sympathy cuts both ways. Patients need it, but also staff do as well. And so whether we think about well-being at work, uh, resilience, having just a good boss and a line manager, making sure that uh, modern employers understand that every citizen or worker has a work-life balance, uh, th this really calls into question, I think, uh, the nature of work prior to COVID hasn't really changed for decades. And we're seeing now, uh, of course, you know, big salaries being offered to recruit or retain uh, staff in various sectors in my own country now, uh, partly because of Brexit, but also partly because of the upturn in the economy post-COVID. Um, significant skill shortages now in the supply chain in various industries. So we are facing a global war for talent, certainly in healthcare. And that means treating our healthcare workers with the respect and I think uh, compassion that they deserve and they require of there to treat, uh, treat uh, patients with the care and respect and dignity they deserve as well. A couple of things before we, uh, we let you go here in our conversation. Uh, there's, there's a big stream of of people who are almost technological determinants, right? They, they really love automation. They love AI. They are really in its grip. But where are, where are the big roles for this now in the near future of the system? Well, they're exciting. Uh, and, um, you know, that great quote, the future is here. It's just unleavenly distributed. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I enjoy tech uh, evangelis uh, ev evangelists. Um, but also, uh, I think anybody that's led uh, health services such as me realise that's easier said than done. By the way, it's estimated that 36% of all health care, care tasks could be automated or supported with digital technologies, including artificial in intelligence over the next 10 years. The real issue is to understand how you actually get clinicians to be in control of that and not be controlled by it. But make no mistake about it, in, in terms of artificial uh, intelligence robotics and machine learning. We're seeing some stunning results now in um, ophthalmology, in oncology and cancer, in radiology and pathology. We're seeing some stunning achievements in robotic surgery. And of course, we're seeing a greater emphasis now on the personalization of uh, medicine. So um, I, I think uh, society needs uh, a digital evangel uh, ev evangelist but we also mm -hmm. need to be tempered in patients in the way that they can be introduced and harnessed in the health service. Uh, last, last question, and please indulge me on this one. I'm, I'm really wondering from, from a, you know, a, a world-class expert like you, how do you define what ought to be the goal of the healthcare system? 
Well, in my opinion, having spent 32 years working in healthcare, the ultimate goals of a health system are better health, better care, better value. Uh, and therefore, it's the quest for better population health, uh, adding life to years and years to life, better care, quality care, better patient safety, better patient experience, and better value care to make sure that we do things better and cheaper, that uh, the taxpayers feel they're getting a good deal for the tax dollar they pay, and that it's financially sustainable in both the short, medium and long term. So my simple answer is better health, better care, better value. Uh, and uh, that really, I think, uh, can be summarized by a healthy health system supports a healthy society, which supports a healthy economy. Yeah. Okay. So then I'll squeeze in one uh, bonus question here. Um, what about our own personal responsibilities? Healthcare starts at home. Um, it, it, it always has done and it always will and it always should. Um, we, we know uh, through uh, numerous, obviously, studies painfully that in many developed countries, the, the life expectancy difference between a, a rich person and a poor person is between 12 and 15 years. Um, but we know healthcare starts at home. And therefore, I really do believe that um, increasingly now, healthcare has to think not of itself as an illness service, but as a well-being, wellness and health service. Uh, and in that sense, our journey has just begun. Yeah. Well, Dr. Mark Bertnell, it's been a great conversation. Uh, I look forward to again talking to you this week at the conference. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Kirk. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Mark Bricknell is KPMG's vice chair in the UK. He's the author of Human, Solving the Global Workforce Crisis. He's one of the world's authorities on the challenge of healthcare economics and some of the available solutions. Hope you've enjoyed our broadcast today. Thanks a lot for watching. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief at BIV. We'll see you again.